Hello world, this is SpartaCast. Welcome to SpartaCast, brought to you by the Social and Psychological Research on Technology Interaction Effects Lab, the Sparty Lab at Michigan State University. I'm Dr. Robbie Rattan, your host and director of the lab, and this is episode 14. My lucky number, 14, because I was born on February 14th. Yes, Valentine's Day. It was a pretty fun birthday. Got lots of attention and cards and stuff, which was nice for an only child such as myself. Um, The 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution ratified in 1868. Citizenship for people born or naturalized in the United States, including former enslaved people, guaranteeing equal rights to all citizens. Um, the 14th element, silicon, and a coincidence, I think not, as we talk about media technologies and computing technologies today with my very own <laughs> father, uh, <laughs> Ramesh Lakshmi Rattan. Uh, my last name is just Rattan. I took that last part uh, for simplification reasons. Dr. Ramnath Lakshmi Rattan, He's my dad. He's also a former Bell Labs researcher. He has a PhD in operations research. He's got a great perspective on media technologies. He's worked around the world with large companies like AT&T, small companies, startups like Vocal Tech. Um, he's in new media, digital media, voice over IP, all the way down to yellow pages and mail sorting robots. He's maybe one of the many reasons why I am so fascinated by this topic. And so I thought, what the hell? Let's hang out with my dad and uh, and mix mix some of the some of the personal with the professional here. But but it works out very nicely. Um, And it's a good turning point in the podcast because we are preparing to no longer talk to stodgy academics like myself only. I am shifting, pivoting to talk about avatars and games as much as possible, focusing on people making these technologies, people who are developing cross-platform avatar systems, which I think are super cool. I can't wait to get the CEO of um, Wolf 3D. They make this product called Ready Player Me. Uh, which is a cross-platform avatar. I can make the avatar on my phone, port it into VR chat or Mozilla hubs, play with it in an Oculus uh, or any you know commonly accessible VR headset, but also toss it into Zoom and, and interact with uh, my colleagues, friends, compatriots, et cetera, in Zoom through an avatar that represents me within just a few minutes. I can set that up. And that might reduce Zoom fatigue. It might reduce other types of uh, inequity, gender, racial, um, just attractiveness, uh, anxiety, social comparison. All these things can be improved potentially through avatars. Of course, they can be made worse. They can be monetized. They can be used against you. So I am stoked about the potential for these technologies and Thus, I want to understand what's happening in the market. My dad made an interesting point. He will make an interesting point in this episode about the relationship between kind of um, structured research in academia, responding to industry, whereas industry is, is more unstructured, is market driven. It has to uh, be cutting edge or else the company essentially or eventually fails through market forces. And so, so I don't want to just ask about researchers' perspectives with this podcast. I want to ask about the the front lines, the technologists' perspectives, and in particular, make those conversations relevant to the researchers. I think our audience is growing in in, uh, the research community. And so we, we of course, want to speak to students and other faculty members who are interested in these topics. Um, But I don't think we should just navel gaze and, and only talk to people within our communities. I think we can benefit from exposure outside of our, our, our towers, our wheelhouses, our insert metaphor for in-group um, and move on. I hope you enjoy this episode. My dad's a cool guy. I think 
well, at least I think I'm a cool guy. So maybe the apple fell close enough to the tree. Anyway, enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to Dr. Ramnath Lakshmi Rattan, also known as my dad. <laughs> I'm very excited to have him here on the SpartyCast podcast. I promise you this isn't just like a nostalgic episode, the Robbie show. It's super relevant. Um, hi, dad. Hi, Robbie. <laughs> Thanks for being here. <laughs> um, so. So you, you I, let's start off with a, a little bit of your history and uh, your connection from academia to industry. Can you can you fill us in? Sure. Well, I was in academia I, to begin with uh, after my PhD at the University of Wisconsin, doing research on on how to get a, a better way to predict what consumers would do with new technology, and built a lab, and got recruited by Bell Labs to build a consumer lab to forecast the future of how consumers would respond to technologies coming out of Bell Labs in particular, and AT&T, the Bell system in general. Bell Labs was uh, you know, the research arm of AT&T, uh, which invented, among other things, invented the transistor, uh, pretty much invented telecommunications, uh, both wired and wireless, and also planted the seeds, including in my own lab, the consumer lab, of what became the internet eventually. Um, and, and what your audience probably doesn't know is that when you were a junior in high school, I introduced you to the guys in the computer science department who invented Unix, by the way. And, and your first assignment was to learn how to program in Java. And I think it was a tic-tac-toe game, if I remember correctly. Yeah, um, I think I did something like that first, and then I made Minesweeper. It was a very ugly version of Minesweeper. <laughs> My UX design um, was just as bad as it, as it is today. But but yeah, that was a fun experience, learning, learning Java at 15 at, at Bell Labs. A great opportunity. Um, you didn't say what your PhD is in. Oh, my PhD is, is actually in, in applied math, but my actual PhD, my dissertation is in mathematical modeling of consumer choice, how consumers make choices, building mathematical models of that. And, and my contribution to the field was uh, to kind of go beyond what was rational utility theory and, and actually bring in the notion of context. So in trying to kind of predict what consumers would choose among a set of things, the context actually matters. And I was able to show experimentally that as you manipulated the context, you could actually manipulate what people would choose, um, no matter what their, their inherent kind of preferences were. And, and so it, it was a very important thing in understanding uh, as you're inventing new technologies and bringing new kind of technical capabilities to the AT&T network and to the marketplace, how do you present it? How do you kind of figure out what it is people are gonna choose? And will it actually become a business? So we studied, will video telephony ever become a business? And right now, and let me tell you, and I think you were, you, know, I, you remember, I brought home two video phones that we were experimenting with. Those things were like a thousand dollars. Oh no, it's thousands of dollars each okay. piece. And then, and you needed two of them for two people to actually talk to each other. You couldn't just, and, and today, of course, you know, the whole world has video phones. And, and my, one of the main reasons I was hired at Bell Labs was, the Bell system, at least Bell Labs actually uh, said that, that, you know, spent over $6 billion from the 1930s to when I joined them in 1986. And they still couldn't figure out if video telephony would become a viable medium. And a, obviously you know, viable from the point of view of economic viability to the corporation. And, and so we did a lot of research on, on things like video telephony, uh, but also remote uh, capabilities across the Bell system network, sensors, various kinds of things, which today collectively people call the internet. So that was a great experience. But after Bell Labs, you know, it was very fortunate to actually work for an Israeli company called Vocaltech. Vocaltech is an Israeli company that invented voice over IP. And that was the beginning of trying to look at things that were just, everything is an application over the internet. And actually that was con converting voice to packets and running these packets over the IP protocol and basically running it over an IP network. Vocaltech invented VoIP? Yep, Vocaltech invented actually the H.323 protocol, which became the standard for voice over IP. And of course, Vocaltech, by the way, also invented this little thing called ICQ. 
ICQ and and wasn't and that like a of, messenger app? Yes, it was the beginning of all messengers, all messenger apps. So Vocal Tech was a unique Israeli company that invented not just voice over IP, but messaging over IP, instant messaging. It's actually called instant messaging. And, and I, they sold ICQ to what became part of AOL and actually became a very important part of the AOL platform. Um, someone who's old enough to remember AOL will actually remember ICQ. Or sure, I think they're still kicking around, getting sold from company to company for less and less money. Uh, but but I, so this is like the late nineties. When did you join Vo Vocal Tech? Uh, 2002. So Vocal Tech invented okay. VOIP in 93, 1993, um, became very big, very powerful. And, and Cisco pretty much took away the business from them worldwide. And they hired me in 2002 after I'd left Bell Labs uh, and done a little startup in the middle, but they hired me to help kind of turn around the company. And I was there uh, till 2005 when I went to the Yellow Pages. So in between, I was at the Yellow Pages and went to the Direct Marketing Association. So my history is a little bit, you know, uh, flipped over in terms of the history of media and communications. You know, started with paper, the Gutenberg press, and the Bible as a, as a medium of communication, and newspapers, and eventually went to radio and television and the internet. So it went from physical to digital. My personal history went from digital to physical because after, after Vocal Tech, I, I got involved with the, running a trade association called the Direct Marketing Association, which is all about communicating using mail, actually direct mail, as a matter of fact. And then I went from the DMA to Pitney Bowes, which is the, one of the world's largest companies creating machines that help create mail in very large volumes. And then from there to Bell & Hall, which is, as you know, we just sold the company two years ago and I'm doing some board work. But the baseline is that I've kind and of- Bell & Hall is also making those, those machines um, that manage the mail, but then you, you changed the business model, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Or not just the business so, model, kind of the production model. So the business model evolution in Bell & Hall was Bell & Hall, like Pitney Bowes, was very focused on creating the technology infrastructure for the print and mail industry. And they still do that. A lot of the focus is on print and mail. But in the, in the world of communications, what's been going on is that paper-based communications has been declining. So newspapers, mail, direct mail have been declining. And, and the internet and digital communications has been increasing, but mainly driven by e-commerce. And e-commerce is all about people going online and buying things that they would normally go to stores and buy. And this whole thing has been accelerated by the COVID pandemic because people then stay at home and just go online and buy things. And so we, I was able to kind of uh, sense this change coming, going back now about 10 years ago. And so we started to invest in actually robotic processes for people that, that would help people to go online, buy their things and have a robot actually deliver it to you. So my biggest customer is Walmart. And of course, uh, we were able to, to sell thousands of these machines to the major you know, retailers. And, and uh, which you know, brings me to the point about media and communications networks. And you and I were talking about this earlier. The main purpose of media and communications networks is, is really commerce. Is to, it's you know, non-commercial communications is, is usually propaganda funded by governments, okay? And, and the reason I, I say that with a straight face is, you know, when, when we were studying the origins of telephone networks, you know, the Bell system invented the telephone network in the, in the US, but very quickly in the late 1800s, many countries across the world started to put in telephone networks. And a good example of what happened in a lot of countries is what, I studied Hungary, where they built this entire communications network but it was for broadcast. It was for the government to broadcast propaganda messages to the population. And it wasn't a two-way communication. You had like something like a radio in your house with a wire running to it. That was a telephone network. And basically all you turned on the radio and you got the government telling you, you know, what was the story of the day or the news of the day. And eventually that became the radio network when wireless radio uh, was populated. Anyway, other than that kind of purpose in, in freer countries and democracies, the only way to face, to fund these kind of networks was to find somebody who would pay for it. And 
The classic example is, you know, the old radio, television, and now search engines and, and, and uh, social networks. The people who actually consume the information don't actually pay for it. So radio was free. Television, for most purposes, was free. You, you bought a TV, you turned it on, and you could get a signal from the air. So who was actually paying for all of this? Well, advertisers. So going back to radio, television, even newspapers, and as a matter of fact, it goes even way beyond that. There's a popular saying attributed to Benjamin Franklin who used to say that a news story is nothing but a story written on the back of an advertisement, which by the way, so it's important to understand that media and communications has been funded by advertising in particular, but other economic means, but mainly by advertising. And it still happens today. I mean, today, for example, you go online, you can download games, you can play these games, and you can play these games with people from all over the world. And in many cases, you don't actually pay for that experience. But there are advertisers who pay because the game platforms that have you go online, you register your name, you play with somebody else, all that detail, that personal information is very relevant to, let's say, you know, uh, Nike wants to advertise their newest shoes to the guys who are playing this particular game, who are, you know, 19 years old and have at least $50 a week to spend. And so they get kind of get all that information and they'll target that advertising to you. So when you turn on your game, maybe you won't realize it, but you get a Nike ad. And subliminally, you are exposed to that particular shoe that Nike is promoting. This so is a, media. It's, well, it's a great, great segue. Great segue. Because I've been thinking, uh, like, let's connect this to avatars. Ad, and I was thinking advertising supported avatars. And it's not just that you get the Nike ad, but in a game like Fortnite, which is free to play if you choose, you can also wear the Nike shoes in theory, right? You can, right. You, you even, you'll even pay to get certain characters from these movie franchises that are essentially advertising the franchise, the culture, the community around those um, cultural artifacts. So, um, we, so we... you know, I think you've got, you're, you're putting your finger on a very important point there. And that is when we talk about avatars, you know, obviously avatars goes back to, you know, Hindu gods uh, having their, their incarnations. And, and, and then in a more modern sense, avatars like, like your PhD research and, and James Cameron's movie was like people having their own personal avatars show up online. So a digital twin or digital presence of an individual person. But an important way to think about avatars is an avatar is, a, is a, an incarnation or a manifestation of any intelligence. So it could be a company. So a company could have its avatars online. And by the way, I mean, this is not a new concept, even in the going back to the days of newspapers and magazines. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you've heard about, you know, Dear Abby uh, or, or, you know, where, where brands would have a brand presence in the form of a, um, an, a, a lady who would give advice or a guy who would give advice. Yeah, yeah. And, take and, it there, Dad. So tell us, yeah, what, what is like the text-based like uh, analog avatar in that sense? You're saying so newspaper uh, representations yeah. of an organization or? You'd, you'd have an opinion uh, piece coming from, and ma in many cases, you know, there was a, uh, the, uh, you know, I mean, Dear Abby is a good example of someone who would give you, give advice. People would write in questions about, Oh, you know, I just broke up with my girlfriend and I don't know what to do. And, you know, and, and then dear Abby would come back and say, so, you know, hey, it's cool. It's all right. It's normal. And so, but in, in many cases that dear Abby columnist wasn't one person. It was a bunch of people who would write, would look at all these questions and write answers every week. I mean, and some of these were life questions. Some of them had to do with math and schoolwork. And some of it had to do with job challenges at work and things like that. But these are basically, it's an avatar representing a particular newspaper or magazine or brand of some kind. That, that's a bit of a stretch of the definition. I mean, I'm even, I'm writing a paper right now about university mascots as avatars for the organization. But, um, but what about just avatars as the one-to-one -one representation of a single human or intelligence? I guess it could be a robot um, or, or AI or an alien and <laughs> doesn't have to be human. Um, but like, what are some early analog avatars? Well, actually, and, and you, 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 what you're saying is right. An avatar doesn't necessarily have to represent a human being. An avatar can actually represent a machine. So for example, as we were building this 
it's called IoT based infrastructure for, for man managing these robots across Walmart's network of stores. Uh, we, we were able to build what are called digital twins of each robot. So a robot, basically, you know, you go online, you buy something, you get a me text message saying your purchase is ready to pick up. You go up to this big robot, which is, looks like a big tower, and you, and you flash your QR code on your smartphone, and the robot goes and picks your purchase, brings it to the door, and, and opens the door, and, and, you, and you retrieve your purchase, and that's how it works, okay? There's a lot of technology inside this robot. And we had 1,500, actually almost 2,000 of these across the whole country. And from a central control room in Bellin Hall in Durham, North Carolina, right here, we could monitor every one of these robots. So we had remote video monitoring capabilities, but we also had a digital twin of each robot in the sense that if, if one of the workers, the associates who are loading the robots with these purchases, you know, did not put it in correctly and it jammed, we were able to remotely see that and remotely control the robot to actually unjam the machine. And that was a very important part of how we could economically service a thousand robots across the whole country. But that was because we had this concept of a digital twin of that robot. And by the way, um, companies like Siemens and Bosch are now creating electrical motors. So, you know, you can build something, let's say you have a motorcycle, an electric motorcycle and electrical motor, and, and you can have a digital twin of that motor on a dashboard somewhere, and, and someone could be monitoring that, and that digital twin could be making sure that it's performing correctly. And if there's some problem with it, it would notify you. So you can have avatars, not just of human beings, you can have avatars of machines. So this is, this is actually a really, this is actually pushing my thinking quite a bit. When we define avatars within our little communication um, scholar, we often just focus on digital representations of humans. Um, yeah. but, but I've tried to push that. I've said, okay, it's not just digital, it's mediated. Because if I'm controlling a robot through a digital connection, but the robot is representing me, so it, the robot could be my avatar, it's not digital. Um, but then I've also thought, all right, it doesn't have to be human. It can be an AI. Um, but one reason though, we're reluctant in, in the field of communication to call, um, digital agents avatars is because we want, we want to distinguish between what we're calling agents or NPCs, non-playable characters, you know, bots. There's a difference between a bot and an avatar because the bot is the thing itself, presumably. It's just like, you know, code alone. But then what you're presenting here is a really interesting new idea that a physical entity that's being driven by some code um, can be represented through another medium, through another code, right? Like a digital twin, you're calling it. And that's an mm -hmm. avatar too. And, and that makes sense. Um, I think the most important aspect of the definition is that an avatar has to be a representation of the thing, not the thing itself. Right. Exactly. I mean, I mean the, literally the term avatar in Sanskrit means incarnation. Uh, you know, it's an incarnation of something of a God or, 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 or a sentient being or something else. I mean, a machine, like, so like what a if, robot. So what if I have, um, not to go too weird and quantum, but, you know, let's say you, you, you take a thing, it's a piece of code, uh, an agent, it's intelligent, and then you split it into two. So then there are two incarnations of the same idea. Mm -hmm. is, is Obviously, you can have multiple incarnations of the same thing. So that's the so first. So are they all avatars? Um, if there is no kind of base thing they're representing, do you know what I mean? Like their incarnation, oh, yeah. or does mm -hmm. there have to be like a higher degree, higher order soul or kind of like core thing that's being represented? I think if you go back into Hindu mythology, there is a core thing and that's a God or, or a human being whose incarnation you're actually interacting with. But mm. going back to your point about, you know, um, bots. And, and avatar bots versus avatars and bots and avatars off bots. So there's a, there's a book, I think I mentioned this to you, um, a very famous author, he's now, uh, you know, it's called Clara and the Sun. And it's, and it's all about a, you know, bots designed as companions for children and the elderly. And, and by the way, the technology is not that far away. If you think about Siri on, a, on an Apple iPhone, Siri is, is, you can actually customize Siri to have your voice, by the way, or my voice or someone else's voice. And, and the Google guys have actually demonstrated that very nicely. 
So you can actually build an avatar of a bot, basically a companion, but somewhat a comp uh, an avatar which is very um, humanized or, or anthropomorphized, you know, with, with a voice and maybe even a face and arms and legs and, and, and looks, like, uh, looks like you or me or, 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 or someone that we can relate to, uh, but it's really a bot. So the, the bot, the bot, and the avatar is what you interact with um, because, because, you know, it may be that it's not the thing bot. itself. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Okay. This is <laughs> for anyone who's actually listened to multiple episodes or knows me as a professor or researcher. Uh, if they're listening to this, they're like, oh, now I know where Robbie gets all of these, you know, like curiosities from like, this is, this is deeply embedded in the conversations that, that my dad and I have been having since I was a kid, um, which is, it's pretty cool to, to do it now here in this context. But I want to take a, take a minor transition away from this topic um, because um, I think there's a lot of value. This podcast has been largely academic research focused, but I also want to learn from industry experts. I want to interview CEOs and founders and people involved in making these avatar technologies. So what advice can you give, uh, not just to me, but to the other academics who might listen or, or just anyone who's, uh, you know, a student of life um, about how to look at industry as a reflection of the future. I, I feel like academia okay. gives us this way of thinking about the future that's that's regimented and scientific and valuable, um, but maybe it's a little bit slow and, and reactive. So uh, yeah, what are your thoughts? No, that's actually a very good question because, you know, I mean, I, having spent a chunk of my life in academia first and then in industry, but actually Bell Labs, which is in industry, but very academic and as an environment, R&D environment, and then actually running companies and businesses uh, my perspective has, has always been that, you know, academia actually tends to systematize knowledge that actually gets created in industry. Industry tends to create knowledge entirely. It's, a, it's an existential issue either because all of industry is based on, on technology, improving productivity in the lives of human beings. That's, that's it. You have to say, actually think about it that way, because if they can't, they go out of business. It's a, it's a fundamental fact of every enterprise is that if they're not improving productivity, if they're not creating new value every day, they don't grow. If they don't grow, they shrink and then they die. So technology and industry is all about using technology to kind of continue to improve the lives of human beings. Think of it as a very broad sense. In this particular case, I mean, we talk about media communications and and. And, and media and, and technology in media communications and how academics can think about it is there's two parts to it. One is to have a good understanding of where technology is going. And in order to see where technology is going, as I said, there's a lot of advances being made in academia, but sometimes the advances being, being made in industry, especially if you read the patents and the, and the competitive kind of work that different companies are doing. So if you take a look at, for example, uh, social media networks today, okay? And look at the innovation going on in social media networks. At first, it was simply a way to co you know, connect groups of people and then find ways to, and, and let me, I'll come back to the whole notion that social media networks are not about the, the people in the social media networks itself. It was really about trying to get enough understanding of at a very granular level about these people so that you can find advertisers who would pay you money if you're Facebook or or, or you know, before Facebook, you know, lots of other social media networks. Until um, they get regulated, uh, antitrust lawsuits break them up, and they have to switch to a subscription model. But <laughs> for now, I got get it. Yeah, that's the model. Well, you know, I'm not sure that that regulators can force you to have a, a subscription model versus an advertising model. Well, if um, they kill your advertising model, there's only that subscription is the only business model left, right? Well, there's there's lots of different ways to. You know, advertising is one way to get people to pay for you to run your business. Um, there are there are government grants. I mean, the government can pay you money to run your business. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think I think I agree with you. Like if for media companies, you need economies of scale because the marginal right. uh, the marginal price is low, the marginal cost. Um, but like you need very very large margin or uh, masses of consumers in order for the small marginal 
return mm-hmm. to, to be valid and have positive externalities. But but sorry, I, I pulled you on a tangent away from no, I think so, where you so were the, going before social media. Where I was yeah. going is this this there's two simultaneous things that that you know those of us who kind of spend time in industry and academia and 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 kind of technology companies kind of use one is having an understanding of where technology is going, where it's been, where it's going, what the possibilities are, what the limitations are. And second is where the market is going. And by the market, we mean consumers, human beings, families, governments, et cetera. And, and, and having those two kinds of understandings is important. So if you, if you look at technology today, I would say technologies like uh, the internet of things, putting sensors in everything, um, the ability to build bots that are much more capable because AI capability has computational capability uh, or, or dupe neural network capability has, has you know, gotten tremendously more sophisticated than it was even just three years ago. Um, the ability to have access to very high bandwidth so you can actually do computation in the network, uh, on a device, on a fabric, in person, et cetera, and people call it 5G, but there's 6G and there'll be newer kinds of, so communications, computation, the ability to do, to, uh, you know, AI based, uh, you know, sensing. And, and so that's technology, that's the technology that's at hot these days and it'll continue to be hot. I actually believe that, you know, especially when you think about sensors, nanotechnology and materials that are very smart materials at the level of atoms and, and molecules are the future. So for example, graphene is being used in concrete to, to do you know, climate friendly uh, buildings, for example, or graphene in, in, in Nike rubber shoes uh, to improve the performance of you know, running and, and, and sports. Uh, but these are all based on smart materials. On the flip side, if you look at society and, and, and people and what's happening there, um, I would say within the last 10 years, for example, there's a much larger acceptance of things that were taboo even 10, 20 years ago. Uh, transgender, LGBTQ. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of battles going on for a long time, but really it's only within the last five, 10 years that there are certain movements. The ability to actually, um, I mean, and, and, and even if you look at, uh, you know, at, at what age do, do kids um, uh, learn how to, you know, I don't know, code. Uh, it, it used to be that, you know, you didn't learn how to code till you were like you, uh, you know, a, a junior in high school and maybe in college. Today, kids are coding at the age of five and six. Um, but that changes what's happening in society. The, 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 the whole concept of the family, the unit, you know, the family as, a, as, a, as an important unit. So understanding what's happening socially, you know, today, for example. And how if it you're relates not, to the technology. And, and bringing these two together to look for opportunities is important. Mm-hmm. And, and um, you know, for example, if you look at the last year and a half, the pandemic actually was a very important part of exploding, exponentially growing the use of e-commerce, in particular of groceries. People didn't want to go grocery shopping anymore. Um, now, as a businessman, I understood that and we planned for it. We watched it going on. And as a matter of fact, one of the, sh- the startups uh, that I sit on the board of is, is launching this thing called you know, Home Valley, which is smart coolers that sit at, the, or at, the, at your front door, which has a refrigerator compartment, a, cooler, a fr- freezer compartment, and a pantry compartment. And you can buy your groceries online and the delivery guys can deliver to that box. And it's a no contact exchange. No, you don't have to see anyone, touch anyone. You don't have to go to the grocery store. You can be, even if you're not vaccinated, you can sit at home and have all your, all your groceries delivered to you. And these, these habits will remain right. And in the same way that we've, we've got all these zoom meetings. I mean, I'm sure some of these podcasts will die out, hopefully not ours, but, um, but there's an increased use of, of like avatar technologies and, and you're saying the pandemic moved us forward and those are going to stay. You think, I think, uh, you know, some of these may not stay, but it's fundamentally changed how people think about socializing with others, who they socialize with, where they go to to buy stuff. People, I mean, companies are going to get people to come back to the office because there are fundamentally certain things you cannot do just online. I mean, Mm -hmm. for example, especially new relationships, 
and what I would call critical decisions, critical junctures. So brand new relationships, it's very hard to cold call people and get to know them on just on Zoom and then build a relationship just on Zoom. You have to meet somebody in person, especially if you're trying to do a deal, a big mm -hmm. sale, you're trying to sell somebody $100 million worth of robots. You know, it's, it's, it, those things have to be done in person. And the same way in, in, in the social fabric of companies, it's very important that personal interactions, what they call co the, the conversations that happen at the cooler are much more important than, than conference room presentations in people building relationships and managing their careers in large companies in particular. So that's going to be always important. But then I think people, companies and people are gonna be smarter about, do I need to be in the office eight hours a day, five days a week, or, do I just need to be there for three half days and the rest of the time I'm on the road or on Zoom? Yeah. I actually think that there's going to be some fundamental changes that will not be reversible. And then there are other things that are going to be just, you know, certain kinds of phenomena that don't go away, like interpersonal meetings. And, and so you know, I actually am a big believer in the fact that, you know, Zoom has actually made this whole concept of video telephony almost trivially easy. I mean, we've been at Bell Labs, at AT&T, Cisco, HP, all these companies have been working on telepresence for such a long time. The whole concept of an immersive presence. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, we, we spent billions, hundreds of billions of dollars as an industry. And I don't think we ever really achieved something that's even as easy as Zoom. Or, and I believe that between Zoom and Facebook and Google and Apple, um, and you know, the, the whole concept is going to become more immersive. And the concept of being immersive has to do with using physical sensors, sensing your presence in your movement. And I, I see your avatar. <laughs> I see somebody's avatar <laughs> yeah. on the screen, Ravi. Yeah, that was me. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, these technologies are, they're coming. They're super cool. It's a major focus for this podcast. Um, we need to cut off. I, I have to go pick up the kids, your grandkids <laughs> from school. <laughs> um, so, but, but I, you know, this was so fun, dad, let's do it again. Let's have you on sure. as a, a recurring guest if you're okay with that. And, and I can prompt you with new questions. Maybe I'll come maybe... back next year and tell you about my master's in nano engineering. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, going back to school. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> uh, but let's not wait a whole year. Let, let's do it sooner than that. But thank you so much. Um, Dr. Okay, Lakshmi Robbie. Ratan, uh, AKA dad, uh, love you and appreciate you being on here. Love you, Dr. Ratan. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. See you later. Let's take a moment for a message from our sponsor. Are you interested in the stuff that we talk about in this podcast, media effects, virtual worlds, video games? Are you an undergrad or master's student thinking about going to graduate school, getting a PhD? Well, check out the information and media PhD program offered to you by the Michigan State University Department of Media and Information. Information and Media PhD program from the Department of Information, uh, sorry, Media and Information. It's a mouthful, it's a little bit confusing, but those two words come together, information and media. What do we mean by that? Well, information flows in society, it affects people. We develop computers to manage those flows and manage the algorithms that influence the people. We look at media from multiple perspectives, effects, psychology, uh, sociology, political science, um, policy, development, game development, radio development. If you're interested in any and all of those topics, well, not you don't have to be interested in all, just uh, some subset of them, check us out. Check out our PhD program. Just Google information and media, PhD, MSU, and you will find us there in East Lansing, Michigan, a beautiful place to live and work, and especially a great place to put your head down and get, get some productive paper writing publications done in the wintertime when it's a little bit cold. You might have heard the stereotype. <laughs> um, it, well, it's more than a stereotype. It's the reality, but it's beautiful in the summers. The fall is gorgeous. The community is strong. Come join our PhD program. Okay, that was our interview with Dr. Ramnath Lakshmi Ratan, my father, my uh, perhaps one of my inspirations, my mentors uh, who influenced me early on in, in this 
interests that, that we've explored here through the Sparty podcast in media, technology, uh, research, and kind of development and understandings. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was nice to, to talk to him, hear how he perceives elements of my childhood being related to this interest, right? Learning to code. I was so lucky. Of course, you know, I, I took advantage of the opportunity of having a dad at Bell Labs to get me that internship and learn Java programming. I was very fortunate in that regard. Uh, I, I remember though, he was telling me at the early days of the internet, you know, go learn to make websites. You can, you, you'll be set. Um, you'll, you'll have jobs and make lots of money. And I didn't entirely listen to him. I followed that internship up um, with with not very much coding. I mean, I, I took coding in, in undergrad, but um, but I kind of wish I had followed that advice a bit more. He's had a really interesting career. His his focus has been consumer oriented from the beginning. My focus has been psychological to to a greater extent, I think. Though I'm interested, of course, in the applications and much of what we study in the lab is obviously related to the design of new technologies, new avatar game technologies. Um, though I think this episode more than any other I've ever done brings out an important comparison between newer media and older media. It's not just a new phenomenon that, that must be studied in a new way. And, and, um, and so that, that's, that's not the point of our research. We need to look back historically, consider avatars from the early stages, text-based avatars, uh, voice over IP in, in a way is, is a potential for creating avatars of voices, right? Like once it's a packet of information, it can be modified through algorithms. It's no longer an analog signal that is difficult to modulate. And so I think I think there's a lot there, which is why I'd love to bring him back, do some more thinking and, and talking through these, these questions, hear about his experience on some of these companies or with some of these companies that are, that are making logistics robots, um, trying to make, make shipping and transportation easier. Um, so thanks, Dad. Thanks for that. That was fun. Tune in for our next episode where we talk with Timu Toke, CEO of Wolf 3D. This is the maker of Ready Player Me, a very cool avatar creation software with a vision for cross-platform, cross-media avatars. I find it super exciting and relevant to the research, and I hope you will too. Thank you for listening to SpartyCast. If you like what you heard, please like, follow, download, subscribe, tell your mom, tell your dad, tell my dad. Tell your neighbor, tell your dog, if they listen to podcasts, especially. Our producers are George McNeil and Taylor Helterman. Thank you for listening to SpartyCast. Our theme song is Empress from Shen Gang, used with permission. We hope to see you next time. Thank you for tuning into SpartyCast. Goodbye, world.